so yeah, so we are going to do a uh, a real honest to goodness uh, live tutorial. Um, I'm going to share my whole desktop. Okay, um, and so uh, no, the point your you can point your web browser at. I the one thing I didn't think of while I was preparing this tutorial was how to tell people how to get where they're going. Right here, if you can point your browser at tutorial tag 30. So all of the, 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 the workshop laptops already have a window open to this, but tutorial pad, tutorial pag 30, all one word, dot jbrowse.org. And that'll have a link to the, the actual uh, tutorial page. Okay. So if I copy this and put it into a browser, it'll give me a very plain HTML page, but it has a nice link on it that has that has a link to the real tutorial page. And so I'm going to open that in a new tab and make it bigger. OK. So this is a brand new instance of, uh, of the, yeah, the link. I will absolutely do that. So it's tutorial PAG 30 right here. I'll make that even bigger. So yeah, uh, so this is a machine that we created specifically for this workshop. It's Ubuntu 20 probably, you know, 20.04. Um, it is running at Amazon AWS. It's a, I think it's a T3 extra large maybe. So it's not gigantic. It's got maybe 30 gigs of RAM. And I created 50 user accounts for which I think I still see some tags over there. If you want to, if you want to participate real in real life, you can use any computer you want as long as you can open a terminal and a, and a web browser, okay? It's got usernames and passwords. And I'm going to leave this machine up for the rest of the, the conference. So if later on you want to try it, you can still, as long as you got a username and password, you can still uh, you can still get in and try these things out. Okay. So I created this tutorial specifically for PAG. Uh, I'm using uh, C. Elegans data uh, because I'm, in addition to being the coordinator of their Gmod project, I'm also a developer for Wormbase. So I have access to a lot of C. Elegans data, a lot of C. Elegans data. Um, so anyway, so yeah, we're going to basically go over, um, basically the prerequisites for installing JBrowse are tiny. Basically, you just have to have Node.js and you have to have a web server. Uh, a lot of people use Nginx. Uh, I used Apache 2 on this instance only because I knew how to set up the like tilde user thing so that we could have 50 users all pointing at different web pages on a, on uh, on this machine. Uh, most of the time, I use Nginx as well, but I use Apache for this one. Um, so basically, I included in here the commands that I used to set it up. You don't have to do any of those things. That's why it says don't do because I don't. A these things you can't do because you don't have sudo. Um, but uh, but yeah, but I wanted to include a documentation. It was really easy to set these things up. Also, I just wanted to say there are a few things that I did specifically for this tutorial that I probably wouldn't normally do. Um, I, you know, I created a, the script that creates 50 users and then creates a public underscore HTML directory for those users. So uh, I did that. Uh, I installed uh, the JBrowse command line interface following the directions, which literally boils down to just this one command uh, using NPX, uh, NPM excuse me, to install it. Uh, I installed uh, some tools that I used while I was preparing data, uh, like BGZip, Tabix, SAM tools, and Minimap 2. Again, those were all really easy on Ubuntu. They can all be installed with apt-get. Um, I, uh, let's see, I put some data on these servers so that they would be available, uh, like FASTA files for C. elegans and C. Braneri, which is a related Xenoreptitis species. Um, I created a simple genes-only GFF file uh, that I, uh, BG zipped and Tabix indexed. And I also created a bash script that's linked to from this page that basically runs all of the commands that I'm going to talk about all at once, basically. I basically did that for myself because I wanted to make sure that the things that I suggested that you do, that they all worked. And it's a lot easier to just run them all at once and make sure that it works. 
But anyway, if you wanted to, you could just grab that bash bash script and run it. Actually, you don't even have to run it as a bash script. You just copy the commands, run it on the, paste them into your terminal, and you'd be good to go. Okay. So to start, open up a terminal, or if you're using one of the conference PCs, there is a PuTTY installed on the desktop. So you can open up PuTTY, which is a SSH client, um, and you'll SSH to uh, tutorialpag30.jbrowse.org and your username in front of it. So it's going to be something like user25 or user04, something like that. Um, and then you'll be prompted for a password. You supply the password, which is going to be user some number underscore some other number. Um, hopefully that'll work pretty well for everybody. We shall see. Actually, I will do it too. Uh, the command I'm going to use is going to be a little different because I'm going to go in as a, a privileged user. But What's it called? <laughs> TutorialPag30.jbrowse.org. What's that? I don't think so because I got in. If I spelled tutorial wrong, then it's spelled wrong in the DNS listing. <laughs> I, and listen, is there, do the Canadians and English people spell it different? <laughs> I don't think I spelled it wrong. Oh, it's because of line wrapping. Okay, got it. Okay, so you should get a, a prompt uh, that shows that you're logged into this machine. Anybody didn't get in who tried? The first thing we're going to do is run the JBrowse command line to install JBrowse. And it is really easy. It is just this command. I'm going to copy and paste it. OK. And so this is very simple. All the JBrowse commands start exactly the same way with the word JBrowse, uh, and then have some verb after that, like create or add track or something like that. Um, so anyway, so jbrowse create public underscore HTML, that says create it in a directory called public HTML, which already exists for all the users. And the last thing is dash dash force. And the reason we have to include that is that there's already uh, a data directory in this public HTML directory to make our lives easier. But this tool wants to be very careful to not to accidentally destroy something you've already got in this directory. So if it detects that there's something in the directory, it'll say, oh, I can't install here. So the force is to say, no, we know what we're doing. Go ahead and do it. So for instance, if I if I took that force out, this is what it does. It'll just say error, can't do it. Okay. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Basically, it's it grabs the file and downloads it, and that's literally that fast. Um so basically it just gets the most recent release and uh it extracts it into that directory. So now we're I'm gonna change directories into that HTML directory and just do a list to see that everything looks like the way it's supposed to look. And that's the way it's supposed to look. So it should look something like that for you. There should be, uh, what, nine, 10 files in there. So that's good. Anybody, uh, anybody not see this? Anybody? Okay. I don't see I don't see any looks that say, oh, this isn't working. Anybody? Okay, that's great. So anyway, this is literally all the data that we need for JBrowse. So in fact, if I go back to if I go back to this page and add, I think it says in the tutorial actually, if I scroll down a little bit, there we go. It says if we go to tutorialpag30.jbrowse.org slash tilde user and the, whatever your username is, okay, you'll see a, a URL. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna say open in a new tab, there we go. That says, it's not found because it says tilde user XX. If you replace it with your number, whatever it is, 24, five, you should see something. I'm gonna replace it with actually my username, which is Ubuntu. And there we go. So I already see, oh, that's interesting. Why do I have something there? I should see, I should see what I said I saw in the tutorial. I should see this. Okay, great. Now I see every, now I see the same thing everybody else does. 
Okay, so the first thing we have to do is give it a reference sequence that we're going to, going to be using. Uh, so like I said, we're going to be using the C. elegans genome. Um, I already prepared it by uh, BG zipping it and SAM tools uh, indexing the FASTA file. So that already exists. It's already in our data directory. So what we're going to do is run this command. It's you know several lines long. We can just copy and paste it. Um, and you can do that. And I'll tell you real quickly what's going on. Basically, it's jbrowse, add assembly, and then the name of the file that we're adding. You know, it's this FASTA file. And then we just provide a few more flags to tell it what to do with it. You know, what to name it. You know, it's C. elegans N2, which is the kind of main research uh, strain of C. elegans. Uh, the name is the thing that we're going to use later on when we need to refer to it. That's the name we're going to be using. So it's not for people to read, it's for the computer to read. Um, we're telling it what type of FASTA file it is. Like I said, it's BG zipped. Um, the load is basically telling the command line what to do with this file. So in place means just leave it where it is. I know what I'm doing. It's where it's supposed to be. Um, other options include copy, like copy it into the local directory so that it does that. Uh, another option is a symlink, create a symlink to that thing. Uh, and I think there's probably another one, but I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about this more later is ref name aliases. I'll talk about a little bit why we need that. But for right now, I'm just going to leave it hanging out there as a mystery for later. But I'm going to come here and paste in that command. And it gives us some warnings and says, hey, listen, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but that file may not be accessible up for, to your web browser. But like I said, we're telling it we know what we're doing. and uh, I'm telling you, I know what I was doing. So it's where it needs to be. It's fine. Okay. So it's warning us, but that's okay. Now, if we come back to this JBrowse where it said configuration not found, if we reload again, we should see this, except it's not gigantic for you, but still. Uh, so yeah, it'll, you know, things like start a new session. If we wanted to, we could click on uh, linear genome view and see that it's actually working. But the fact that we see this page lets me think it's working. Okay. All right. So what to do next? The next thing to do is let's load some data. Um, let's see. Oh, we could actually start, I could start a new uh, session. So I'm going to switch over to this tab and I can say start a new session. And yeah, so it'll be gigantic. I'll maybe make it a little smaller. There we go. And so if I say launch a linear genome view, there's a lot of other options here, but none of them we can use right now because we don't have anything configured for it. But we can say launch a linear genome view and it'll say, okay, well, I know about this C. elegans uh, reference sequence. So we could load that if we wanted to, I can say open it. Um, there are no tracks to open yet. So I could say open track selector, but nothing happens because there's none configured, okay? So what we want to do is give it a track, some track information so that we can load it. So most common thing probably to use for track data, you know, for features is GFF3. Um, it looks, you know, it's a tab delimited file format. I'm not going to talk about it much. I included some sample of what our GFF3 that we're using today looks like. Uh, but if you need help making GFF3, I can help you with that. Um, it's, it's more complicated than it seems like it should be. But anyway. Um, so again, probably the easiest way to deal with GFF3 data in JBrowse is to, uh, BG zip it and Tabix index it so that we can just use it directly. Um, I did that with this command. It's kind of like a little magic, uh, Unix command to sort the GFF and then, uh, BG zip it and index it, but you don't need to do that, uh, because I already did. Um, so then we come down to this command which looks pretty similar to the last one we had. It has, it has the same load in place and it tells it instead of add assembly, now we're adding track. The data file that we're adding uh, is this GFF file that has just the Elgin's genes in it. The name of the track, in this case, this is the part that's going to show up that humans are supposed to read. It's gonna show up next to a checkbox that says, turn this thing on. So it's gonna, the name of the track is just going to be genes. And it, we also give it a description that I'll show you what, what uh, what we do with that description here in just a second. Um, Colin or Rob, if I search in in JBrowse for tracks, does it search the description text too? 
Okay, good. All right. Um, so that's good. Okay. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to copy this command. Oh, and the load in place is the same thing as before. It just says leave it there. I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to copy this command. Hit return, and it says add track with name genes and gave it a track ID that it just generated, which is actually just the name of the file. And if I come back to JBrowse, hit reload. I'm going to make this a little smaller still because it's very crowded here. There we go. Yeah, that's still usable. Okay, so I can now, I can turn on the genes track and it's going to complain. It's going to say, listen, you're zoomed all the way out on chromosome one. There's a lot of features there. Either zoom in or if you really want me to, you can force me to load it, but I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. Oh, this this is a this is a context menu. Oh, this far right track. Oh, that I'll show you that. That's uh, that's also a context menu. But I'll 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 be referencing that hopefully soon. Okay, so I could force it to load all of those genes, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to zoom in like that. And yeah, okay, so there we go. We've got some genes. Does anybody not have a genes track? Anybody? It's all working for everybody, right? It's so great. You can grab a hold of the bottom of it. If you come down to the bottom of the track, you can slide it, you can grab it and slide it like that. Oh, yeah. Um, Okay, great. Okay, so we've got genes, terrific. We're cruising. We can do stuff with these genes. The main thing people would do at this point would be to click on it and you get information about it, including information about features. You can get sequence from it just by doing that. Oops, that was an accidental right click. Um, yeah, so you can you can get sequence and it, I think it's highlighted according to sub features. It's hard to do on the screen that's so zoomed out anyway okay but i'm gonna oh i gotta zoom out a little zoom out a little more okay there we go okay so that's great um one thing that we would like to do is make it so that we can search for features in the, the interface okay and jbrowse has support for multiple indexing uh, search index, indexing sorts of things. Kind of the, the most common one you'd see is the one that you would just, this JBrowse text index run using the command line tool. And it will basically look at this, um, this GFF file and extract all of the names and IDs. Uh, but we do have the option of saying, look at other things too. And in particular for this worm data, um, the way the, the worm-based people have created this data is, the human readable part for gene names is actually in an attribute called locus. So there's locus equals and then the gene name. So I can say, okay, index the name, which is some WB gene and then like a bunch of numbers or the ID, which is probably the same thing, but I don't remember off the top of my head. And then I can say and index locus too, okay? So I'm gonna grab this command and I tell it specifically to index just the GFF, but since that's the only data that's in there now, it's not gonna index anything else anyway. So I'm gonna copy that and come back here and paste it in. This will run mm, maybe about a minute, maybe a little less would be my guess. I guess it depends on if uh, 30 or 40 people are doing it. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I guess we'll see. Um, but while that runs, I'm gonna come back here. Uh, I should have actually ran it and then told you about searching for the, uh, uh, doing the indexing stuff, but that's, but there is a screenshot of what it looks like. Basically, you just start typing things. And it does kind of the typical autocomplete sort of thing. Okay. Oh yeah, we're pushing this baby hard. If anybody gets theirs killed, let me know. Because I'm curious, I'm curious. Uh, um, I have a feeling it's just doing a lot of disk read and write, uh, which is take, making it take a long time. I don't think it's, super memory intensive. Yes, that's fine. That's a great idea. Right. 
Yes. Yeah, so it knows um, in the configuration, which I don't wanna really look at because it's a lot of JSON, it knows what assembly is attached to what files. And so I told it specifically what file, you know, what data I was gonna be indexing. So it just knows that that's associated with this reference to sequence. Um, if, if I just run this command without telling it what, uh, what tracks and specific, you know, specifically to do, it will basically look through the whole configuration and index everything for every assembly. But still, if I'm looking at, say I'm looking at a different assembly, it's not going to show me options for, you know, for, for any other different assembly, it's only going to show me options for the ones for which it applies. That sound right, Colin? Yeah. Okay, great. Still grinding away. It's close to done. Yeah, well, there is, I mean, this, this to me is not uh, unusual. There is a little bit of a lag when it, when it fills up that, that bar. Uh, there is a little bit of a lag while it, I'm guessing it's writing or something. I'm not sure what it's doing at that point. Is it sorting? That's what it's doing. Oh, so this is the memory, this is the memory intensive part. Probably. Uh, yeah, this is the current one. It's just the, um, I forget what UCSC calls it, but it's, um, we call it uh, 235, WS 235. Yeah. So the load average there is uh, 15. That's not terrible. When I was testing this one, I definitely had it higher than 15. I wrote a script that basically would uh, do, run minimap as many times as it could until it started killing them. And I ran it probably 15, or no, 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 like 30 times, I think. I, it was run 30 times all at once. Yes. Okay. I, actually, I'm going to show you that in, in uh, just a couple of seconds, I hope. Okay. So if, as long as, uh, as long as you can read it and it's got accessible, I think uh, for Bigwig, it has to be, are you familiar with cores, C-O-R-S? Oh, so they should have core stuff available. Um, so basically, it's just leaving it in place, and it just knows how to go fetch as long as it's indexed, and the index is, you know, like in a normal, you know, yeah. Oh, because big white doesn't have an index. That's right. Um, yeah, it just leaves it there and basically grabs out whatever slice it needs to uh, to display the data. It's just making a note of saying basically this is the URL where it is, and so yeah, so it just leaves it there. Okay, cool. Wow, advanced user, advanced. Okay, so that, that seems advanced, sure. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, is everybody's indexing done? Okay. I, I didn't notice when mine finished, so. Uh, so anyway, I reloaded the browser page. Um, and so now I can type typing like the name of a, uh, uh, C. elegans gene, maybe. Come on, you can do it, buddy. Uh, so elegans gene names are always three characters, three alpha characters, a dash, and then a number. Uh, so I type L-I-N, because uh, I know there are Lin genes. There's also unc genes, UNC. Um, UNC sometimes give me trouble because browse, uh, Apple wants to be very helpful and complete that to uncle before I get a chance to actually use the gene name. Um, so yeah, so I like did so Lin2 I know is a gene. Yeah, so there it is. Um, unc9, that sort of thing, there we go. So yeah, so you can see that it, it, it uh, so it should be completing uh, a gene name. So if I, uh, so there's unc9, but it's actually hiding down here. There's unc9. Okay, all right, great. So everybody's got the name indexing done, terrific. Um, okay, so 
The other thing that people have a lot of, if you really like JBrowse, is you probably have a lot of JBrowse one data. Trust me, at Wormbase, I have a lot of JBrowse one data. Uh, so I want to be able to, the, the, the most common format for that data to be in is called NC list. It's basically what you get if you were using JBrowse one and said uh, you ran uh, flat file to json.pl, right? It basically generated this directory that has a ton of, ton of subdirectories in it, lots and lots of files. Basically, that's called NC list. Um, and so there's an NC list adapter as well. And so I'm going to use uh, some of that uh, data that's actually powering Wormbase's JBrowse uh, right now, the JBrowse one instance. So it's basically the same sort of thing. JBrowse add track, that's the same as before. Now I'm giving it a full URL uh, that points at an S3 bucket, an AWS S3 bucket, which is where we store our Wormbase data. And uh, yeah, so that's basically this whole thing, that whole URL. I'm giving it, in this case, it is a collection of protein coding genes only uh, because our users like to have, you know, specific types of tracks like that. So we have a protein coding genes track. We have a non-coding genes track. We have a historical track of genes that used to exist but don't anymore. Um, and so basically all it is is location, name of the track, and a description. So I'm going to copy the command again, this command. There we go. And paste that in here. There we go. And yeah, it added a track with name protein coding genes and gave it gave it not a very useful track ID. I think that uh, if I were doing this a lot, I would probably specify, you can specify a track ID for it to use. Right now it's using, it's again, just taking the name of the file, which is just track data. It's not very helpful. If, if I were doing this for a lot of tracks, I'd have to give it something different. But if I come back to JBrowse again and reload, there, now I've got a protein coding genes track. And there we go. And then there's some data. The track ID is, is in the JSON configuration. So, I mean, normally we don't see it. If I look at these three dots that are after the track name, I can get about this track and it does have the track ID right here. Oh, well, because it would want to, it would want to give it, um, it would basically start reusing it. If I were using the same, if I were using a bunch of NC list data, it would want to give it the same name, same track ID, and then that would cause conflict. So, uh, I think the order is just the order in which they appear in the config, I think, right? Colin, does that sound right? Yeah, so basically just the order that they appear here is the order that they appear in the configuration. Yeah, well, there there is a way to make uh, categories, and I'll, I'll I'll show that in a few minutes as well. Okay, does anybody not have a protein coding genes track? It's all good, right? Great. Okay. Oh, and also, I just wanted to point out before I had dash dash load because it was using it was local data that was on this server. In this instance, I'm just giving it a URL, and so like I said before. If it's a, a a remote URL, it just says that's where I find the data. That's all I need to know. It's not going to do anything with it. It's not going to grab it and download it. It's just going to use it in place. Okay. Um, I did write a section here about if you have JBrowse one, how to find the URLs that, of NC list data. I don't really want to spend any time talking about it, but you can always come back to this tutorial and 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 uh, and use it to figure out to figure out how to, how to write that URL for the the NC list data. It's basically requires reading some JSON from a from a, a, a JBrowse one instance. Okay, BAM and CRAM data. Uh, again, I've got a ton of worm uh, BAM data. Well, not a ton, actually, I have some. Uh, so I got this from, there's a, uh, a C. elegans natural diversity resource where they basically sequence a whole bunch of different strains of C. elegans. And so I basically asked them if it would be okay if I took some of their BAM files and used those for this tutorial. They nicely said yes. Uh, so anyway, so it's the same sort of thing. It's basically JBrowse add track, the URL where the thing exists. Now, again, this is a BAM file, which means somewhere there's also a BAI file. Um, 
as long as the BAI file is named the same and is in the same directory, I don't have to tell it about it. It's just going to it's just going to assume that that's what it is, what where it is. If it is not, you can you can supply another command line flag that says this is where you find the BAI file. Okay. So anyway, it's just add track URL and the name of the track that that's going to appear next to the um, the checkbox. So I'm going to run that. Okay. And come back to JBrowse, hit reload again. And there we go. There's the BAM file. And I'm going to load that. One of the things that working on JBrowse 2 has made me realize is that I need a much taller monitor. Um, it's, I mean, it's really bad since I'm projecting it, but even when I'm at home, I really want to get like a 30 inch monitor and turn it on its side. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and hit force load. I don't think it's going to be too bad. Yeah, I mean, it's just one jeans worth, but it's pretty, it's pretty dense. So, anyway, so the BAM file, yeah, it, lo it gives you both uh, the read information. I assume these are short reads. I don't know off the top of my head, but it looks like it. Um, yeah, because this is only one gene. So these are obviously short reads. Um, and it also gives you like a coverage plot up here that also puts, um, uh, it'll show mismatches that go up to the coverage plot. So it's pretty nice. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of options you can use. So again, on the on the track label, there's this dot, 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 which is a context menu. And I can just click on that. I can do things like, you know, uh, change the way it looks. I can change coloring, like the color scheme instead of normal, I can change it to uh, per base quality, which it is pretty useful actually. Like if I zoom in, yes, yeah, so that's a lot of, all right, I'm gonna, Close this one. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. There we go. And so it's really nice. So that the, that kind of yellowy color that means that's pretty good quality, and the red one's bad. And you can see like mismatches and stuff. So here's the mismatches. Here's a mismatch that goes up. This is probably a real snip because it looks like it's pretty uniform. I don't know. Is there a key? You just need to infer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, yeah, good good idea for some documentation that's not existing right now. Okay, all right. Anyway, VCF data is exactly the same. Yes. A gray color instead of what? Oh, that's because, um, so I basically, I, in this context menu, I said, uh, let's see, pile up settings, and I changed the color scheme. That's that's why it's this color instead of gray. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. There. So I just, it, it's, there are like a bunch of different ways to color the, the way it looks. Okay. Okay. Uh, VCF files, exactly the same. Uh, here we go. Oh, yeah. So actually, this one is interesting. So the, the last couple I've shown you are on AWS S3 buckets. Uh, this one's actually at a Google API, a Google Drive type thing. But this is like a public, this is not on a, um, it's not password protected. This is just a public Google Drive. Um, and this is VCF data that comes from the same place, the C. Elegans uh, diversity resource, whatever it was, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and basically, they have a bunch of VCFs, and so it's the same sort of thing. I can just. Uh, this one is just basically comparing one strain to uh, to C. Elegant. So it's a C. Elegant strain. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this BAM track because it's pretty big. Anyway, pretty simple variance. That's easy. Um, let's see. Bigwig again is very much the same. I'm actually not even going to run this. This uh, adding a bigwig, it's basically it's exactly the same. I say there's a JBrowse add track. This one points at some data at Broad. Again, it's just going to fetch it from Broad. You know when it needs it. It's basically a um, uh, I forget what the program is called, but it basically does. Uh, it's like a conservation thing where it looks at reading frames. So if it, it finds you know uh, so frame one usage is basically just 
when you're looking at reading frames, it's, this will light up if it's frame one. So that, it looks like that. Um, one thing I will mention, remember I said when we added the assembly, I said, oh, it has uh, an alias file at the end of the command. The reason why it needs it is because people disagree on how worm uh, chromosomes should be named, right? So at worm base, the chromosomes are all Roman numerals, I, 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 I. Um, at UCSC, they are CHR and then I, CHR, I, I. And um, I think those are the two main options. There probably are others. So anyway, so because kind of that name of that location is very important, we have to have a way to deal with when people disagree on how to name things. And so there's a, a file that basically it is literally, this is the entirety of the alias file. It is just, here's what we call chromosomes. And here are other options for things other people might call those chromosomes. Yeah, it, right, it'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, so so like I said, yeah, so like these, bro, the Broad data uses a lowercase chr and then a capital I, which I think is what UCSC uses as well. Okay. Um, I will though, this is where it gets a little complicated. So, so far, everything we've done has been pretty straightforward. It's basically jbrowse, add track, and then something that comes after that, usually like a URL. Maybe a couple of flags, you know, a flag to say what name, maybe give it a description. There, yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. Uh, will it overwrite? I don't, I don't know. Will it give an error? If, if I, let's see, so if I, so I already ran the thing that added this variance track. If I do that, yeah, it'll give an error. I thought I kind of thought that was right, but it's better just to try. Okay, so like I said, so so what we've done so far has been pretty straightforward with the command line, um, but we can do much more complicated things. So uh, Colin mentioned that there's a multi uh, a multi bigwig track. There is no easy way to add a multi bigwig track on the command line, but the fact that there's no easy way doesn't mean we can't do it, right? So this. Oh, let me shrink it a little bit. It doesn't even fit. This is a little bit the, the JSON that we need to create a multi bigwig track. It's basically gives things like tells it what type it is, it gives it an ID, gives it a name, uh, tells it what assembly to use. There's that assembly that we needed before. Um, and then it says, then there's another section that says what adapter to use. And then there's a list of bigwigs to put into it. Um, and then this little display thing here basically just says, uh, it, again, it's telling you how, how to display it on the screen, okay? And what we can do is we can take this whole bit of JSON and make it into one line and stick it on a command line. Now, that is going to create a very long command, right? So if I, if I highlight this and then start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, it's good. You, you definitely could. But I can, uh, but um, yeah, it, that would not be an unreasonable thing to do. I would do that. Um, but I just, by triple clicking on the, on the word jbrowse, it basically highlighted the whole, that whole command. So I did that, I triple clicked on it, copied it. And if I come here and paste it, that's the whole command. And then I'll hit return and it goes ahead and, and it adds it. So basically, uh, uh, it probably just does it as is because it, the, basically the thing that is different here is before we were doing add track, now the command, now the verb is add track JSON. I think it's probably just going to put it in exactly the way we wrote it. Oh, um, I, do I have port 30 open? I mean, 3000. I'm, did you try port 3000? That might work. Um, I think, I think there's one port open. Whatever the default port is, I think I opened it. Okay, so I'm gonna reload. I already ran the command that added that JSON. And then this is the track, the forward philo CSF. I'm gonna turn that on and that should get some big wig data. Yeah, there we go. So this is, uh, it's basically using conservation across multiple uh, uh, Xenorhabditis species. 
And I'm not sure exactly how they do it, but it, it looks at protein coding regions and basically gives a positive score if it's the, that region shows conservation that indicates that it's probably under selective pressure. Um, but there's a little bit of hand waving here because I don't really know, but it's something like that. <laughs> so it's basically the forward frame one, forward frame two, forward frame three. So if I put this up with, right, so see like right here, see how it's, it's positive in the third line and negative in these. So it basically says that this exon is probably being translated in the third frame. So it's science. I don't know. I honestly don't know how they do it. <laughs> I think it is multiple species, but I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it's different species that doing conservation across them. I'm pretty sure. Okay, now synteny. So, um, uh, like I said, uh, we've got a ton of data for uh, C. elegans. There's also a fair amount of data for other Xenorhabditis species at worm base. So what I did was created some comparative data between C. elegans and a fairly closely re related species, C. brigsiae. Um, it's either 20 or 100 million years diverged. Uh, when I asked some of my worm friends why they can't nail it down any better, they basically said, no worm fossils. So that's why they don't know. But it's 20 to 100 million years apart. OK. Um, so basically what I did was, to do this, I ran Minimap 2. I added this minus C that basically generates cigar strings so that we get to see the individual base uh, variations. And, and then just the, the location of the two files. And then I output it to uh, a path file. Um, don't do that, though. OK? It will work, but it, you'll end up getting the, the operating system is pretty good about killing things that are overwhelming it. Um, this this minus C actually adds a fair amount of strain to to what it's doing, so best not to do it. So that I, I already did it. No, that's fine. Yeah. So so it's basically, yeah. So so it's um, it's generating it's doing the comparison between these two genomes, and we'll use you know you'll have coordinates basically in both sequences. You'll have it in the C. elegans, and you'll have it in the C. brigzi. So it's basically taking those two FASTA files and doing comparison and generate, and it will give that PAF file that it's generating has coordinates for both sequences, okay? So the thing is, in order to display it, we need to add a new reference sequence. We have to add C. Briggsy as a reference sequence. So this is exactly the same as the very first add assembly we did for C. elegans. Did I miss a J? Ah, select, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it gives me that same warning that it gave before, basically saying, uh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to use that, but we'll be able to. And, and so like I said, so now this is the command I run, ran to get the data. Here's the command to add it. Basically it's the same add track. So it knows, it knows that it looks at it and says, oh, that's a PAF file. So I know that it's a Synteny track. Um, one thing that's new is I have to tell it which assemblies it's for. This thing tricks, trips me up about 50% of the time because order matters. <laughs> so the way that I ran the minimap to that command means that C. Briggsy has to be first and then C. Elegans in the list. If I switch them, it won't give me an error, but it also won't show me anything when I open it up. It'll just be an empty, empty display. Um, but otherwise, everything else is the same. It's just that assembly name is new. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna run that too. Okay. Uh, because it, it, um, it has to do with how the, the PAF file is formatted. It's basically, there's no real identifiers in the PAF file that says this is C. elegans and this is C. Briggsy. So basically, I'm telling it. And you know the the first set of columns is C. Briggsy, and then the second set of columns is C. elegans. Um, it it does doesn't it give a warning if it's like um, if so say for instance the the chromosome names weren't the same. I think in C. Briggsy they are the same. So it's capital I, capital I I. Um, if 
if they aren't the same, it will, I think the user interface will give you a warning that says, I think you may have gotten this backwards. Okay. Right, exactly. Right. So anyway, so uh, when I reload, now I've got this new track, C. Elegans, C. Briggs, C. Sintony. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. I'm also gonna turn this one off. And so, yeah, so I get this, this, this feature here, this is a Sintony feature. And like Colin was saying, um, I can just right click on this or control click if you've got a Mac and open a Sintony view for this position and it opens up kind of a new, a new frame. And there we go, scroll down a little bit. And so right now it's just showing me this is the comparative. Obviously there's not, not a whole, not real interesting because I didn't turn on any tracks. What I want to do at this point is give it a, um, I also have a data set of uh, C. Briggsy genes so that we can actually look at those. So scrolling down a little bit farther, I can add this track for um, just C. Briggsy genes. And if I come back here and reload again, nope, not there. If I come back here and reload again, uh, it'll be aware of it. And I can now say, okay, for this one, uh, I can say open the track selector. It didn't look like anything happened because uh, it's the same, because this is the C. Elegans track. This is the C. Briggsy track. So if I click on this one, open track selector, now I can say, oh, well, I've got a track, just one, one interesting track that's C. Briggsy genes. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And then up here, I'm going to hit open track selector again and say, okay, well, I want to turn on the genes here as well. So I can see, I forget, I think this might still be on 9 I don't remember. But yeah, so I can see that there's been like insertions in the UT, a lot of, lot of in UTR type stuff. Uh, my guess is that since this has been cultured so much, there's probably been, probably lost some UTR stuff, would be my guess, as opposed to the other direction. But anyway, there are differences. So the yellow is deletions from here relative to here, and blue is insertions from here relative to here. But Again, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know which which direction that happened. Yes. Ah, I'll back up. Okay, so here, uh, let me close this. Okay, and turn the. Okay, so when I after I added after I read the command that added the PAF file, I reload, and then I've got this. I turned on this uh, C. Elegans C. Briggsy Sintony. Okay. And so you have something that has this like mostly pink bar. If I write or control click on that, I get this context menu. Um, and then the bottom option is open Sintony view for this position. Oh, did you, um, well that, did you run? Oh, but you had this, you have that and you right click on it and you get that menu. And then when you click on it, it doesn't do it. Huh, well that I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna turn these. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Jeans. Um, anyway, there are several things I can do here. Um, one thing that I frequently do after I, right after I open up a Cincinnati view like this is I zoom out a little bit uh, because I wanna see what's going on in the, in the surrounding area. So I'll do stuff like that. I might zoom out a little bit more. Um, I can also change, I can change kind of the way these look, although I don't know if it'll do it, how interesting it'll be at this level, but I can say, um, I can tell it to use curvy lines. So there's another, another kind of context menu up here, this dot, dot, dot here. And it basically says, oh, oh yeah, see curvy lines. Woo. Yeah. Red, red is match and then yellow and blue means stuff's in or out. Yeah. Um, trying to think. But anyway. No, infer it. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it's back here. <laughs> right. 
Oh, that's interesting. So it's it's just how to activate the, what is the right click? Ah, okay, yes. Yes. I know it, so PAF file is what Minimap 2 outputs, but it also accepts output from like MC Scan X and I don't think uh, I don't think you can do blast. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it can't just be a random tab file. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, so anyway, so we got into the Synteny view from the linear genome view. Um, it is also possible to get to it from elsewhere in JBrowse. So if I say, if I go back to the splash screen and have this start a new session, now there are things that I can select from here, like a dot plot view. And if I, um, under the file menu, return to splash screen. And then uh, start a new session. Probably, yeah. Where it says new session, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think of that. Okay. Um, and if I select dot plot, then I get this display, and I will tell you once again, order matters. Um, and because order matters, I'm going to go back to the tutorial. Of, yeah. Okay. So now it's C elegans first, and then C Briggsy, and. Elegance, then see Briggsy. And if I hit this radio button that says existing track, it'll open up this new display that says, oh, well, I found this, this configuration that seems to match up what you want to see. Uh, this is it's a drop down menu, but there's only one item in it. So it's selected the right thing. And then if I hit launch, now instead of, right, Synthony, it gives me this dot plot um, where I can see, you know, like long sections of of similarity and i can like uh colin was saying i can say so in this section of chromosome two where is it right here i'm going to select like this section in chromosome two that has negative that's that's has a negative slope and i'm going to say open linear synteny view and again this is not a lot of space here um but yeah so this gives me kind of a this is pretty pretty zoomed out um I do like when I'm zoomed this far out, I like having curvy lines instead of the straight lines. I agree, I think there's more, more attractive. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. So I've got this section here, and then I've got this section here. So I'm kind of filling up the whole screen. Um, one thing, obviously, like I said, so it looks like there's been some inversion relative, you know, from one genome relative to the other. Um, one of the things I can do is, so in the enclosing kind of uh, maroonish color in that frame, up here, there's a little menu that's hiding under these three lines. And if I say view one menu, if I select from this menu, view one menu and say flip horizontally, there we go. And now basically I've taken the, the top chromosome and kind of flipped it. And so now instead of looking inverted, it looks like it's all lining up. So I just, so now, now, now the lines are all nice and pretty and stuff, and I can zoom in and look at things that I want to look at. Oh, uh, I will back up and show you. So any region, in any region, I can just highlight a region. Yeah, to click and drag. And then after I click and drag, it pops open a menu that's either zoom in, so I can zoom in, I'll do that too. Um, and it shows me that, um, and I, I can say, oh, well, that's what I really want to see. So I'll select that and then open in linear Zintini view. Right. Right now it's only pairwise. Yeah. All right. Any other questions about Zintini stuff? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I'll go ahead and flip it. Yeah, so I will flip it. Uh, actually, I'll turn the gene tracks on first. Well, okay, it's not going to draw them because it's going to be so zoomed out, it's going to say there's too many, but I'll still turn them on. 
Oh, no, I didn't say there's too many. I thought for sure it was going to complain. Yeah. Well, there's more C. elegans data than there is uh, Briggsy data. Okay. And so now if I say menu one and flip horizontally, they all just flipped. Uh, I guess you're going to have to take my word for it, though. Oh, this is a this is not a gene track. That's a symphony track. Ah, see, there you go. That's why. So yeah, so I mean, um, let's see. So I'm currently flipped, which is why the line, lines are all straight. Um, and if I, on this gray bar, if I zoom in here, it'll zoom both regions. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, there's not. So, so right. So if I were, um, let's see, what do I want to do here? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, "How? Do, where am I?" Right. So the only thing I the only thing I could just suggest here is that there's just zoom way, you know, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, and then be like, and then you're like, "Oh, well, it's here," and then zoom back in. Yeah. Yes. I don't think there is a um i don't think there's a way to do that right now that's a good idea certainly a plugin a plugin could be written that would do that um I'll, yeah exactly rob's like yeah that's a good idea yeah yeah and in fact that's that's actually a good point because sometimes you can have really kind of not very high quality matches that are very messy um so yeah having a way to filter that would be a really good idea Yes. Well, so like, so like MC scan X, I have used a little bit like on our more distantly related genomes. Um, our curators have created basically lists of orthogonous genes. And so basically, I can take that and feed it into MC scan X and it will generate the, a file that that JBrowse will use. And that is a lot cleaner because a human is like, oh yeah, these are the same thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, I, I I say if you're doing a protein based uh, synteny, you're going to end up generally with cleaner results. Whereas this is nucleotide based, yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, it's still it's still going to be pairwise, right? But like for, at worm base, there are like three or four different C. elegans assemblies, and I have them all compared. They're generally not that interesting because usually because they're pretty closely related. It's there's usually like gigantic blocks of synteny. So it's, but um, well, um, I mean they're not. Uh, Oh, you don't have, you don't have, uh, well, I mean, basically you have to do something to provide the data, right? And if you want to compare two assemblies, you have to tell it something about the assembly. Um, okay. It is. Okay. Okay. I don't have a ton of time left, um, but I do want to talk about uh, structural variant data. So um, to, to display this data, I found a paper that was published like a year or so ago where some people had compared uh, C. elegans, kind of the base strain to a couple of strains that were uh, different and they found some evidence for structural variation. And so I emailed them and said, hey, can I use your data? And again, they very nicely said yes. Um, so they ran a tool called Manta, which operates on short reads and uh, tries to predict where structural variants are. Um, and so they gave me that data. Uh, let's see. and. 
let's see. So to start with, oh yeah, okay. Um, actually, before before I do this part, before I do this part, I want to add the two tracks that we want to use, and those are down here a little bit farther down underneath these screenshots. Um, there are these two sections for adding um, uh, a variant, uh, a VCF track that has structural variant candidates in it, and then the BAM data that goes with it. So I'm going to run. I'm going to add both of these. And then if I come back up here, there's a VCF file. That's what this URL is. It's the VCF file that we just added a display for. For doing structural variants, you kind of start kind of at the beginning, you know, start a new session sort of thing. So I'm going to copy this URL that is just for this VCF file. I'm going to copy that URL. Where is it? Copy link. There we go. Okay. And then in JBrowse, I'm going to start a new session again. So new session. Up on the file menu, new session. And now I'm going to tell it I want to do uh, an SV inspector, structural variant inspector. And then when I launch view, I get this menu where um, there are multiple things that I could give. I'm going to go ahead and paste that URL in. There we go. And it automatically detects, yeah, it's a VCF. And it uh, guesses that it's for uh, C. elegans N2, which is what it's for. Um, but I could also tell it that it's wrong and select something else. But it, it picked the right thing. And then I'm going to open it. OK. So now what it did is it opened that, that VCF file. And this is the result of all the structural variant predictions that are in it. And I can mouse over these. And it highlights them as I mouse over them. Um, I can also filter them, like Colin was saying. I think uh, probably the easiest thing to do so that so that I get looking at what I wanted to look at is if I create a filter, I think I put a range in the tutorial for what, what I want to filter on. Somewhere, there we go. That's the, that's the range I wanted to filter on. It's basically because in this paper they said, oh, we found evidence for structural rearrangement in this gene. I don't remember what the gene was. Um, but I do know that those are the coordinates for that gene. So that's why I'm going to create. OK, sure. I will come back here. So, oh, if I wipe this out, uh, so if you say new session, and then you get a menu over here, and it's SV inspector. And then you paste in the the URL for that VCF file. Okay. And then you don't have to do this, but I'm doing it so that I can see what I want to see. Basically, I'm just filtering by location. Create a filter, and then I paste it in that that location. And basically, there's just two potential structural variants. I think they're right next to each other, so it looks like they're overlapping here. Um, I can. I can highlight a row and it will show me only that one. So if I highlight this, it actually took one of these lines away in the circular view. And so if I click on this, it now opens this display. Now this display doesn't look like very much right now because there's nothing open in it to show me. So again, I can open the track selector on each one and I'm gonna open, ah, oh, reload. I forgot to reload because these, these are the two tracks that I need. Oh. And there's the category. Somebody asked about categories. Yes. I will show you that if I come back to, I just say category and give it a name and it creates a, a subcategory. Yes, any level. And I don't remember, I think it's comma, comma separated probably. Yeah, that's what I thought. So don't put commas in your um, track, in your category names. Okay, so. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn on these two tracks, but I have to do it twice because I've got two different things. I've got something here on, uh, I don't know what chromosome it is. I've got something here on chromosome three, so I added those. And then down here, I've got something on chromosome five, so I've got to open those same tracks. And there we go. So. 
Yeah, exactly. It looks a little bit like abstract art, sure. Uh, but basically, these lines show where there are read pairs that mapping to one chromosome and then mapping to another. Um, and actually, this has also read pairs that are kind of more distant than they ought to be. One of the things I can do to kind of filter this data and make it a little cleaner looking is say, um, this right here, this button right here, kind of at the top of the view, it says, what does it say? Toggle rendering interview links. Intraview, there we go. So if I hit this, it will basically now just leave me the lines that are, that go between chromosomes as opposed to any reads that are not the way they should be basically, right? So there we go. So now there's basically, this whole prediction of a structural variant is based on three read pairs, which, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know enough about the science to know whether or not that's sufficient to say there's a structural variant there. Um, obviously the people who wrote the paper felt that it was. So uh, there we go. Yeah, exactly. So that's, I, I feel a little uncomfortable saying, yeah, that's, that's, enough data, but again, the, the authors thought that that was enough. Um, what, one thing I, I, I generally like to do is have the two VCF tracks next to each other. So these are the two, you know, the, the two VCF features are tied by this green bar. And yeah, then, then the individual reads with the gray lines and everything moves, you know, so you can scroll around, zoom in, you know, take a look at stuff. But anyway, it's a pretty neat view. I think it's pretty useful. Are you talking about this? This in blue? That that is from that is from the VCF file. That that is um, that's in the VCF file. So it's just it's just using it as like a description of the feature. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I have got ten minutes, but I want to tell you about Jexel. Okay. So Jexel is the JavaScript expression language. Um, it's basically kind of a stripped down JavaScript that is safe enough to let users use without breaking things, is what it boils down to. Um, it's got a much more limited set of operations that you can do compared to regular JavaScript that is really just, that is well suited for doing this sort of thing, that basically modifying the display of how things look. So. You may have noticed that all of the features that JBrowse draws, like individual discrete features like genes or SNPs, they're all a horrible orangey yellow color. I hate that color. What? I hate that color. But uh, the, the good news is I'm not stuck with it, okay? Um, that is not peach puff. <laughs> yeah, just trying to distract me with color names. Uh, this is goldenrod. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, uh, goldenrod, this orangey yellow color is, um, yeah, it's, it was the default color for features in GBrowse, and then it's the default color for features in JBrowse 1, and lo and behold, it is the default color for features in JBrowse 2. Oh yeah, that's right. That goldenrod shows up in CMAP a lot. Okay, so um, oh, you know, I'm not gonna. I, I want to stick to the tutorial, so I'm actually gonna close this this window. What did I do that on? I'm gonna I'm gonna reopen a linear genome view. It's the elegans. Um, let's see. So. Yeah, so I operated on the genes track. Okay, great. So if we were running something called the JBrowse admin server, we would be able to change this for everybody who's using this JBrowse instance. But uh, we can change it, at least for us as individual users, and it will stay that way whenever we come and look at it again. The problem is it won't let you change it on like the, the genes track that is provided by us as administrators but we can make a copy of that genes track that's our personal copy. And so the way we do that is by clicking on that dot, 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 which is a context menu, 
and say, copy this track. And so that creates a session track called Gene's Copy. And I'm going to turn that one on and zoom in. All right, zoom in some more. OK, great. And so there we go. There's some nice goldenrod genes. Now what I'd like to do is, now I've got many more things that aren't grayed out. And in particular, settings, if I click on settings for this genes copy track, now I can see a whole bunch of stuff that I can change, a lot of stuff. Some of them, if you change, it will break the, the track, but we're not going to do that. Um, but I'm going to scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Oh. Um, I need to zoom out a little bit. Nope, out. Yeah, because I was cutting off the, the edge of the display. Um, uh, I scrolled down too far before I realized. Okay, there we go. Display one uh, renderer. So here's, yeah, golden rod. I can just, now I can just type the name of another thing that I'd like to see. So peach puff. And yeah, and then it just dynamically changes. It took a little while to do it because um, there's just a lot of features. I realize it doesn't look like it, but there's a bunch. Yeah, there's a lot. And so there, that's Peach Puff. And so that's great. Or if I like blue, I can also change it to blue. Great. So blue feature is terrific. But in here, in this little this little radio button here on the very edge, if I check that off, it says instead of using just the 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 text that is in here as the name of a color, um, use it instead as a little bit of Jexel, a little bit of this JavaScript language. Okay, and so that's why I changed it to put it in quotes. So now it's just now it's not blue, it's blue. Um, but I can change that and put in a little bit of Jexel. Um, so for instance, it's just just this little bit of code. So I can say, okay, I can say get feature. Basically every bit of Jexel in JavaScript mostly starts with this, get feature and get something about the feature. So in this case, I'm gonna get the strand of the feature, you know, either plus or minus. And then uh, in GFF, strand is either plus one or minus one or zero, okay? And I think in all these genes, it's gonna be one or the other. It's not going to be zero. So basically it says, if it's, if it's greater than zero, give me, make it red. And if it's otherwise, make it gray, uh, go bucks. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. <laughs> Hilarious, okay. And then now where it says blue in quotes there, I'm gonna go ahead and paste this little bit of Jexel. And now I've got positive stranded genes that are red and negative stranded genes, genes that are gray and yay. Terrific. Um, and I can, I can obviously expand this. I can, instead of just doing red or gray, I could change this and say, now get me something else and do something based on it. I, there's a lot, of, a lot of flexibility I can do here. Um, other things I can do, oh, one of the things I really hate is that these gene names, not so useful, but remember I said the lot locus is where the good gene names are. So what I'm gonna do is, yeah, uh, if I come back here, I think if I scroll just a little bit, oh yeah, right here. So this, uh, this is where the, the, the actual gene name is dis displayed. This is what gets displayed under the name. And so it's get feature name. If I change that to get feature locus, why didn't that work? That should just work. Maybe I need to zoom in. There's too many. No, it shouldn't require a reload. It, it does it dynamically. Oh. That's the mouse over one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of hard to see, but Sophia can see it. She's close. So she, she will attest to the fact that, yeah, now when I mouse over things, what'd I do? How'd I, oh, because not all of them has a locus entry. That's why. 
that's why that's why I didn't actually want to make it the 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 name because yeah, not everything has not everything has a name. But yeah, so when it does have a name though, it'll it shows up there. Yes. Yeah, so basically um I really don't have time to show this, but what I did with a lot of worm base was I would actually open these tracks in the JBrowse desktop and do this stuff over here to make it look the way I wanted it to look. And then I would just copy that bit of JSON and put it into my, my config. Can you, can you... Uh, I don't think so. Is there a way to do that? What's that? Oh, I I don't think I ever noticed that. Thank you for pointing that out. You're right, I could. Yes. Yep. Um, I don't know what you could do with the PAF file, but yeah, I mean basically every everything that everything that has a checkbox over here you could do stuff with. Yeah. Okay. I think. Oh, that's that's right. I wanted I was I made it more complicated. I because I put a label on it because I thought it was too skinny before. So if I come back here, settings. Oops. Yeah, that's better. See now it's a little longer. <laughs> yeah. you can do. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I think that may be. Yeah. And then the last section, I didn't want to do this um, because it would have been chaotic, and I would have had to open up ports for every user, or different ports for every user would have been a mess. Um, but there is the admin server that Rob was talking. Rob, did you ever get it open? Probably not. I'll have to check. I will. I will go ahead and open whatever the default port is, so that if you want to run it, um, you know, over the course, you know, if you have an keep your keep your username and password, the machine will be available till the till PAG is over, um, and you can run the admin server. It basically, brings up a JBrowse that has, in addition to these menu items, also has an admin menu item where you can like start doing things. You can. These you can make changes like this, and instead of making them local, it will actually write the change to the configuration file. Um, yeah, um, it is in the same directory as uh, that we started out in this public HTML directory. There. Yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, and I have done it many times and broken many things. <laughs> yes, I think it's JBrowse remove and then the track ID. It's JBrowse, right, it's JBrowse track remove, right? It's remove track. Okay. I know. I know. Well, it's funny that you say that because I had the same problem. I, I feel like I should be editing JSON all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Okay. All right. Any questions? Oh, man, I went over a minute. I, I've got a talk I'm giving in about a half hour. So, yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the tutorial we've been doing is this, this, um, this page. Um, on gmod.org is going to stick around basically forever. And I will be adding to this, I'll add a link. I'm gonna make uh, an Amazon AMI a image of this machine. Yeah, I'm gonna make a, a Amazon virtual machine and link to it and make it public and link to it from this tutorial. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, very good, thanks everybody.